Andrea, welcome to the Sports Editor. Thank you for taking time to chat us in, in the interesting country of, of Russia. And it's, it's good to hear about rugby and how it's being developed there. So thanks so much for taking your time to be on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Cool, man. Andre, you started, um, you, started, you studied at the University of Bloemfontein um, and you studied sports science um, and you're obviously in a very strong rugby area being Bloemfontein. Um, why did you study sports science and were you involved in coaching there at all? Yeah, so um, I'm actually an a old Durban boy um, from a management totally, but when I was very young, I, I watched the Schimlers play at club champs in Durban. Um, at the old Toyota Club Champs and uh, just the way those guys play rugby sort of left a, a mark in my uh, <laughs> mind about this is how we should play rugby and I went up to study obviously sports mad at school, uh, played cricket at provincial level, played rugby. Um, so when I went up to uni university um, I got there and suddenly there were like you know 400 boys trying to oh. play under 19 for the university and uh, just the, 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 his, the mass wanting to play and wanting to do well um, was amazing back then. And yeah, so I basically played cricket and uh, rugby for the university um, while I was studying. And... Then after studying, I got straight involved in coaching. Um, and also while I was busy with my masters, um, Dr. Derek Kutsia, who was the Springbok conditioning coach, um, got me involved as a conditioning coach initially with Free State Junior teams. And yeah, sort of from there, it just sort of grew. But um, before my masters, I did do coaching at schoolboy level. Um, and that's where the coaching bug bit. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Because then also after that, you spent some time in, in the Northwest and you, you did well there. And, and you're involved with the Leopards. And did you sort of feel your time there really cemented um, your name in the rugby world? Yeah. So, look, obviously, uh, you know, there's two ways of getting into coaching. A lot of old players get into coaching. Um, I was fortunate unfortunate to get an injury injury pretty early in my my career um while playing at rovers in durban and, and then i then i moved moved into the coaching uh, sort of um career path very early and when i got to leopards it was it was it was actually a picker um because the pick rugby institutes under 19s under 21s play as the Leopards in the provincial competition right. in, the, in the A League. And obviously, um, if there, there's generally seven teams in that competition where Leopards is most probably the most unfancied uh, um, provincial team. But we, we've been, we, we were very fortunate because the university takes the rugby very seriously and it's quite close to Gauteng, so you get a lot of a lot of uh, boys coming from the Gauteng area um, wanting to further their studies and further their careers in rugby. And so at the, at the Rugby Institute in Poch, it was a really good system in terms of developing players. And um, so I remember 2010, especially when we are on the 19s, uh, Leopard under 19s reached the semi final. Um, we only had six Craven Week players in that team. Um, and then there were four players who actually played for their school's third teams. Sure. So it was a, a lot of rugby development going on. Mm -hmm. And I think having had success with, with, with them, um, sort of it, it, there were a few, few opportunities that came along, especially then at the Cheetahs where. I'd studied and I'd known the guys from, mm. from do, while I was doing my masters for those two years as a, as a conditioning coach. But at that stage, I'd already moved into to the, 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 you know, the coaching side of things. Talking about the cheaters, um, you obviously spent some time there as well. And something tells me you're very competitive because you always seem to do well wherever you go. Um, <laughs> is it, does it help that you, you love the, the, the determination and the pure love for rugby? that was at the University of uh, 
free state. So, so look, uh, the one thing about the free state, it's a great brand of, of rugby that they play. They always will, will try and throw the ball around. Mm. Um, they do have financial um, constraints in terms of budget. So everyone thinks it's just sort of a continuation of Grey College. Um, yep. But in the, last, in the last couple of years, that wasn't always the case um, okay. because the top unions with better financial offers try and lure those top boys away. But um, generally in, in Bloom, we believe, we believe that those boys will come back. So we, we weren't too phased about it at that stage. But if you're not competitive in rugby then, um, and you don't have a competitive spirit, um, it's, then, then, then you must try and stay away because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because um, yeah, the, the more competition there is, the better. Mm. And um, yeah, also just love the underdog tag, you know, to, to, um, to work really hard with, with a, a group of players and then um, hopefully get good results. So yeah. that's always sort of been uh, one of my, my philosophies in coaching is you've got to love the fight, you know, the fight that's to prepare. Um, rugby, I, I still remember one of my worst hidings was with Leopard, Leopard one year at Loftus and I had a huge team and I just realized that day there's no um, mercy in rugby. So mm. you have to also prepare without mercy. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Very but, good back there. but off the field, there's nothing um, stopping you from having a good relationship with your players. That's very important. Yeah. And I think that's what makes rugby so unique. Eh? It's just what you said, how people are relentless on the field, but always after the game. Um, it's always like, hey, you know, rugby's won. So although you might learn a tough lesson, rugby's actually come through and won for the day. So <laughs> it's, it's good. Yeah. You then you then went off to J uh, Japan. How good is the sushi? <laughs> yeah, look, I must say that uh, South African sushi <laughs> didn't taste the same when we came back. Yeah. Um, but it was a great time for my family and I. Um, hmm. the, the the sushi was amazing. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, gr no, great experience. Because if you want to talk about it, you know, every year they seem to be making inroads and just getting a bit better and better and better. Are they... Yeah, so, so, so to give you an idea, yeah. um, so we went, uh, well, Darby Tron got offered the job there and he um, asked me to go with him as his defence coach. And um, obviously, it was a great opportunity. Um, and also, where I'd been a head coach mostly at junior levels, it was an opportunity to, to specialise in one area. Um, Although I like to be a, more an attacking-minded guy, I, I love doing the defense. Um, and you were coaching against guys like Robbie Deans, uh, oh. Jake White. Um, oh. uh, the current Reds attack coach was at Corby at the time. Um, and there were a few others. The Brumbies attack coach now was at Suntory. Wow. So as a coach, where in South Africa at that stage, you sort of, no new when you play the Bulls, you're going to see this picture of the Bulls. You know, if you play a uh, province, you're going to see this sort of picture on attack and defense. Um, it was really to me exciting because, yeah, you were playing against a New Zealand coach, an Australian coach. Jake White was coaching the out of a blitz at the time, so so you were seeing different pictures, and that was really good. Um, what also impressed me with the way the Japanese do things, because it's a company-run team, um, so the team actually belongs to a Vodacom or a uh, okay. MTN. So, so they've got huge money which they, they pump in. So the facilities are second to, to none, I think. Yeah, sure. The technology is amazing. Ten minutes after training, I would have my... Um, a video on my laptop coded so um, yeah so that was really wow. yeah it, it was um, it, it was really good in terms of so so that's why they're improving one thing is obviously um, the time I was there there was about 15 South African coaches in and around the circuit in Japan um, and then also 
Australian, New Zealand, uh, Tongan, Fijian guys. So there's a lot of really quality coaches um, going around in Japan. Um, and that's improving the whole standard. So, um, and then also the other thing that they, they did back when I was there, we only allowed three foreign players on, on the field at any time. Okay. Um, so generally the clubs would have six players, three on the bench, three on the field. Um, but now they've also changed that to allow six players on the field. So just for the Japanese players to play amongst better players yes. or that, that will be improving um, their game and also training, training along and with those players. You know, they see the professional guys, what they're putting in, in the gym, off the field, etc. So, yeah, no, that was, a, that was an amazing experience. And, yeah. uh, and that's why I think, you know, um, obviously a lot of Kiwi coaches as well. And, and, um, but because all the club systems are getting better, that push, pushes a better product towards the national Absolutely. team. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's also obvious, obviously a lot of guys that are qualifying, foreign players that are qualifying, like Lapis and, and a few yeah. others here. Sure, definitely a team to watch. And they are, like I said, I think every year they're going to just get better and better and better because they, like you said, doing all the, the PT work to get to where they want to go. Mm. You then came back to South Africa and you worked at Paul Boys. I just want to get your, your thoughts and opinions there because everyone rants and raves about schoolboy rugby in South Africa. That's it's the best in the world. But the concern that I'm thinking is that it has not reached its peak. And will it maintain that? Or is change coming? Oh, that's a very interesting and debatable question. <laughs> um, look, in Paul, you've got inter schools and you've got those two grade schools in, in Paul Boys and Paul Gym. Um, and I can tell you that competitiveness between um, those two schools, just to name two, it's unbelievable. I yep. was. I was actually godsmacked about the competitiveness and, and the, the effort being put in. Um, and then I look at Gray and what Vessel, Duplessis and the boys at Gray are doing. Um, you know, um, a lot of the times I told uh, when I was coaching provincial under 19 rugby, uh, sometimes it would be a letdown for some of those boys to come to provincial under 19 rugby out of scuba rugby because in scuba rugby you've got your 5,000 supporters, 2,000 from each school, you know, sort of already there. Yeah. And then you get to a year later, you get to under 19 rugby and there's 10 people and a dog um, watching the boys. So, um, so schoolboy rugby will always remain strong. Um, whether it's healthy, it's really debatable because at the end of the day, it's about developing um, – developing players I think with the current uh, trend of conditioning coaches school rugby has come like a mini academies all over so I would say you're going to look at 10 to 12 really competitive schools in three to four years time maybe even less than that yeah um, and that, that is sad but um what you also find is that a lot of the players by the end of the matric year is close to having developed, um, especially out of a physical point of view, to sort of the top end of their potential in terms of physical development, which in the past you didn't see. And I think that's something which you don't see in, in the New Zealand side. Yeah. When, we, when we played at World Schools, um, like, for example, we played uh, Christchurch Boys High, who's a top school in New Zealand and what uh, what surprised me was that those boys were actually physically not as developed as our boys okay. um, but skillfully they were they were still skillful and, and, yes. and that sort of thing so so I think after school the New Zealand system um, sort of develops the boys in a physical uh, yeah. way where our boys tend to be pretty much um, close to developed at, at a very high level at school level already. And it is an interesting one because, 
you know, your, your diehard fans will say, well, South Africa's won the World Cup three times. We must keep doing what you're doing. New Zealand's won it three times, so they must keep doing what you're doing. But it just in terms of, like you mentioned, which worries me is that just club, club rugby is essential. If club rugby falls apart, then, you, you know, you're done. You're pretty much left in the dark, whereas New Zealand club rugby is so strong. But yeah, yeah, anyway, so, mm. so, so, so that's what I always used to say, you know, in terms of under-19s coaching at Leopards is that we've got to go and look for the, for the, for the gems, the undeveloped gems. And then really spend a lot of time developing those boys hard. And if you develop those boys hard, then you'll find the Luet de Jager, Akka van der Merwe, those sort of players who came through the Leopard system while I was there. Mm-hmm. And, 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 but my, my worry is that you're going to see less and less late developers if, if we don't create a pathway for, for late developers because... Um, there's so many boys that, that, that have got a lot of talent, but just didn't have the advantage of being at one of those big rugby schools. Ah, so true. So, so true. But then now you find yourself in, in Russia. I hope you are behaving yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but rugby in Europe is becoming more and more attractive um, because the players can live a, a better life now because the contracts are more professional and there's better systems in place. Um, in your thoughts there, do you think Europe is going to be like a new powerhouse of rugby just because players are sort of flocking towards there? Yeah, look, it's uh, one thing that's difficult with, with Europe um, is that, that the, I must be careful what I say, but um, it's still very developing. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, currently in Russia, I think we five five South African coaches that are in and around. Um, there are a few Georgian coaches. Um, so in terms of Russia, what they are doing though is that they're putting uh, uh, quite a bit of money into getting foreign players and coaches to the clubs. Okay. So we six we we six South Africans around here. Yeah? So um, so. With that comes that the clubs are starting to become more professional. I know in Spain and Romania, there are also quite a few uh, South African players and coaches, more players. Um, and those, those people are driving standards and driving um, performance at the clubs because it's difficult for the national team coach if he's getting a product that's not being coached properly at the club level. Um, and I think that's what, what, what's starting to happen now, but it's still very uh, at the start of the, the, the sort of development phase, I think, in, especially in Russia. I think Spain and Romania are slightly ahead, and having spoken to a few of the coaches there, there's, there's a, quite a few islanders, um, and even here in Russia, they, they, at the one club, or a few clubs, they have got some Fijians and some Islanders as okay. well. So, so, so that just means you're, you're uh, because in essence, we had to improve the Russian players um, because at the moment we only allowed six players uh, from South Africa on the field. So you've sold your bulk of your team are, 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 are Russians. And um, yeah, so that's, that's the challenge here to try and develop um, you know, to develop the Russian players and to get them at a higher level. Interesting. Interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. And how are things going at your club? It's Slava Moscow? All going Slava strong? Slava Moscow. Yeah. yeah so so we, when I got here sort of mid uh, last year, um, we were generally, um, last year there were only eight teams in the league um, and uh, we were generally like fifth, sixth and then we had a really good season last year we ended third so um it was the first time in 12 years that they ended in the top three um so it was it was a really good uh good season and then we started off pre-covid uh really well um and then we we um we had really two really good warm-up games um it was looking really promising and uh and then the first game of the league, we, we did well. But since um, COVID struck now, um, we are, we, we've lost the last few games. Um, but yeah, that's uh, one thing that's 
that the, 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 the club's been really impressed with is the way we've developed our attacking game. Nice. So generally, generally the game yeah, in Europe has been sort of set-piece dominant. You scrum and maul, and if you're good at that, you'll be, be getting results. Um, where now, at least, we can move the ball past the inside centre. Um, because I think that's one thing where, where, the, where there's a struggle is um, you get some, some really tough men out here especially like the Georgian props and, and, and hookers. Um, and then also some of the Russian boys, really good scrum technicians. Um, but being able to move the ball and play an attacking sort of brand isn't, isn't in their sort of uh, mentality. I think also because of the weather, you tend to find <laughs> that you've got four seasons in one day oh, in, yeah. in, in Moscow. So... Yeah, but it's 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 the club is in a positive. Um, it's really a positive place to be at, and um, even though we've got like now eleven people that are or players, eleven to thirteen players that are sick or missing, um, mm. we 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 keeping positive and, and yes. yeah, trying to stay healthy. Yeah. No, definitely, because I don't think we realise how big Russia is. So if you had to give us sort of an idea, what's your closest fixture? And then how far you have to travel for your furthest fixture? <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is interesting. Um, yeah. So so we've got two other clubs in Moscow, which is basically an hour's travel um, from us. The one is an hour. One is two hours uh, by sure. bus, and that's just in Moscow. Yes. So then uh, we. Our furthest opponent is actually a cup game we, which we play in Vladivostok, which is a nine hour flight. Wow. So, to give you an idea, um, yeah, it's basically on the eastern tip of, of the continent, um, wow. of the Asian continent. And uh, so, it's just above the northern tip of Japan, which is wow. quite interesting. So, <laughs> so that's our furthest sort of uh, flight that we would have. Um, so we've got an interesting one. We've just come from five hours, uh, five hour flight. So there wow. and back um, um, east. And now this weekend we'll go 10 hours there and back. So you do it. <laughs> yo, 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 you're going to have to pitch when you get out of the plane. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is you've got to, as a coach, you've got to also think about, you know, that travel, um, who have you got the following week? Um, yeah. Do you, send, do you send your strongest team? Um, almost like the Lions do when they play in uh, Buenos Aires, you know, they tend to, tend to sort of send their, yes. their second stringers because of the travel really causes, can cause havoc. Yo, that is interesting. That is interesting. Wow, wow, wow. But Andre, to be a head coach must have always been a, a desire of yours. And um, did you feel being in Russia could put your sort of skills to the test and at the same breath experience like a new way of life and rugby? Yeah, look, um, I think uh, having been a junior head coach, it's, it's, uh, it was really um, like a... It, it, it was a good experience because you can play a big role in the player's development. Mm -hmm. um, where at senior level, the, the challenge as a head coach is to try and keep it fresh and keep it uh, interesting for the players, um, but also keep driving the standards. So it's definitely a big growth. I must say um, I've been privileged to work with and under a few really good coaches um, you know, a guy like David Tron, he really was exceptional in Japan. Um, just the way he drove standards and kept on uh, challenging the coaches underneath him. Um, and that's how you as a coach will learn, but also being in, the, in, the, in that cauldron. Because to me, um, coaching is about how you can handle the pressure. So the pressure shouldn't change who you are as a person and a coach. And because... Because the pressure will rub off onto onto the players, and um, 
So that's a big thing which only comes with experience. And um, and that's especially now, you know, we have, having started, we the first week we, we'd beaten a team that were the, the cup champions and second in the league last year. Wow, okay. The, so it was it was the first time in 12 years we'd beaten them. Sure. But now suddenly we'd gone gone into a bit of a slump because obviously we're missing a lot of players and we don't have the depth that um, the other clubs have. But so, so that's a challenge as coaches. How do we handle that now? Mm. And that's where you grow as a coach. And, and so it's easy to go and listen, okay, let's go. We're going to now drill these oaks to pieces, but will that work? How will we get their mindsets back up? Um, and, the, and that's the, the, the challenge about head coaching is how you handle that pressure um, to actually change change the way the season's going when sometimes yeah. it's tough, sometimes it's well going well. Yeah. I mean, you can look, look at even a guy like uh, Warren Gatlin, who's a top top coach. I mean, what he did with Wales is insane. Yeah. And now yeah. the Chiefs suddenly the Chiefs when they started Super Rugby, the Chiefs were on top, <clears throat> doing well. And now in the New Zealand competition, they haven't won a game. Yeah, won a game. So sure, yeah, it's... So that's gonna. That's going to take all all his experience, and and that, those are the lessons that you can only learn when you're in the head coaching role. So I'm privileged to be a head coach. Um, I'd want to be a head coach back mm. in South Africa, hopefully one day. And um, yeah, but this is a great experience, especially working with different cultures, because yeah, um, like in South Africa, although um, we have a, a lot of different cultures, we've still got a, a mentality of grit and determination within our cultures when Russia um, it's it's different because they've always been provided for in the communist times they haven't had a lot but they've been provided for so to develop grit and determination when it's going tough that's sometimes a difficult thing and that's what I'm learning sure oh, that's a very interesting thing that you say at the end there yeah it's a good good way of looking at it sure grit eh? it's interesting very very interesting um so it's sort of like a, a new league that started up in, in Russia. And do you see that league sort of being one that is just naturally going to attract players? I know we sort of touched on it earlier, but with the league getting better and better and better, similar to maybe that even Japan, is that going to attract even more players? Yeah, well, um, I spoke to a representative of the, of the Russian Federation the other day, and he they, they are busy with the program to try and naturalize a few players. So obviously now it's a five-year process. So it seems as though they do have um, a big plans in Russia. Um, and currently, I mean, there are a few clubs who have uh, most of the top clubs, about six, uh, um, seven clubs have eight foreign players on their sure. on their. On, on their sort of on their rosters mm. so so it, it is a good opportunity for players and especially in South Africa at the moment so um, a lot of the players after under 21 um, where in the past they would go to um, Rikwas or Pumas and then if they don't get in there they'll go to some of the smaller unions um, now in South Africa, those smaller unions are struggling in terms of financial uh, sustainability and they're only, only offering the players a six-month contracts and stuff. Sure. So a lot of, you find a lot of those players, players who would have been playing for Leopards or uh, SVD or Boerland, um, Falker, those sort of unions, those players can earn a decent living in, in Russia, um, you know, maybe earning twice or three times what they would at those smaller unions. Um, so for them they're loving it and they're saving they can mm. save a lot of money because the clubs pay for their accommodation they pay for um, uh, their flights from South Africa home and back and so so for a lot of South African players it is a good opportunity um, but yeah they must understand that it's not necessarily the standard that they used to back home yeah, very, very interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure it all comes with challenges. And, and what is life like in Russia? I mean, you, know, you hear lots of different things and it's quite maybe a bit hardcore at times. I hope you haven't had a chance about any polar bears from the rugby field. I'm joking. 
<laughs> it seems like it's it's really an, an eye opener when you get that, like you've, you've mentioned earlier. Um, but again, I think it's that's what makes it why people want to be there because it's it is different and it's something you're like wow, this is actually unique in its in its own way. So yeah, it's it's, it's really really interesting. Yeah, look, uh, so so winters are terrible <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you just see snow and no ter- winters. It was my first winter and it was, wow, it was interesting. Um, you train in, at an indoor facility. Um, so it's got its uh, challenges, but Moscow, where we are at, is a, a great city, um, a first world city. I mean, the, the metro is amazing. Um, and yeah, you, I mean, I'm sitting right across from one of the biggest malls in Moscow. Um, so... It's it's not that different, say, to any city, I would say, in Europe. Um, obviously, the only thing, the language is a bit of a mission. And um, the Russian people, although they look very glum and cold, once you get to know them, um, they can be, be really warm, warm people. So... Um, I think it's just a mis, uh, misconception, you know. It's <laughs> like when I went, like when I went to Japan, they told me, "Oh, geez, you're going to eat rat and dog." And, dog. <laughs> yes. and <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> yeah, <that's funny. laughs> but 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 in Japan, it's not like that. They yeah. uh, that's more like a Chinese, Korean, North Korean <laughs> thing. But um, yeah, no, Moscow, it's it's pretty decent and. And even in Krasnoyarsk, where one of my friends coaching, um, great, great city. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's not a lot different to um, mm. any, any cosmopolitan city in the world, I think. Uh, that's good to hear. Yeah. And as we sort of draw to, to a close, just want to touch, um, obviously, SA Rugby, because it always seems to make the headlines, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and there's so much talk about what's going on. Um, but SA Rugby and where it's headed, is it pretty much all doom and gloom or is playing perhaps in the Pro 14, the saving grace? Because it looks like the teams are going to be out of Super Rugby, but then it leaves the Cheaters and the Southern Kings in a, a rather difficult space. But is the Pro 14 sort of the saving grace for the teams? Yeah, look, I think um, from any difficult time, like any world war in the past or whatever, um, things will eventually recover. Mm. So, so to me, that's just uh, the message. Although it is doom and gloom at the moment in terms of where will the global game go, um, travel restrictions, etc. Um, one thing about the Pro 14 is that it's it's a great competition in terms of different conditions. So it will expose our teams to wet conditions which um, if you look at both the Cheetahs and Kings is that they've struggled overseas. Yeah. Um, and it's the, the teams in Europe have, uh, have actually been very fortunate to be on a COVID uh, coaching group um, with about 50 coaches from around the whole world, um, which was started by an Irish guy, Bernard Jackman. And um, a lot of the guys from, from, um, from the uh, UK and, and Irish clubs and stuff on it, and I think the coaching at in 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 the UK and Europe, there's a lot more detail to to it because of the conditions. For example, what arm do you carry the ball into contact, um, and the smaller details of playing in wet weather, and that's something that the South African uh, coaches and players aren't always used to. And it's uh, those little details that, um, you know, um, that will improve our game if we do play in the Pro 14 and still do have the home fixtures where we can play on the hard, drier surfaces. Um, so I don't think um, playing in the Pro 14 will be doom and gloom for South African rugby. I think in, it, 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 it will grow the game in, in different ways. Um, and also, for example, I mean, the Cheetahs were flying, winning all those home games at the start of the season. And then they had to go to Limerick and it's raining cat, uh, dogs and cats. And, and suddenly it, it, it puts an emphasis on the kicking game and how do we play in the kicking game. 
And what what I've seen out of just looking at watching a lot of the games is um, the detailed uh, kicking plans that the the opposition play in in Pro 14, especially the European teams. Um, they or the British teams, British and Irish teams, they tend to to have a lot more detail on those kicking plans and um, and also manipulating your backfield so that you can kick into space. Um, and that will actually um, actually assist our players in developing, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, and to our coaches in developing that sort of um, game systems where obviously at test level we do kick the ball a lot and, and it's working for us. Um, it's at the, at the club level where those, play, those teams can, can kick the ball, but they also can move the ball and the way they move it and kick it into space um, are things that, that most probably um, South African rugby can improve on. Um, so I think yeah, it's, the big thing is that we, we, we need, a, we need a, a trans-border competition to keep uh, the television rights um, and to keep, keep, keep professional rugby going in South Africa. But that we've got enough talent coming through from grassroots level, from schoolboy level, that's definitely uh, the case. Um, so I don't think it will be all doom and gloom playing in Pro 14. Um, obviously, um, hopefully they can try and keep all the teams involved. Um, but that there, there will be a new model within South African rugby. Yes. That, that must be a definite because yeah. um, I don't think we can we can um, keep 14 professional sides going. Um, but yeah, it will be interesting times to see what happens and how things go. Yeah, um, very, very interesting times indeed. And I'm sure, yeah, it's just around the corner to see what, what happens next. But yeah, wait, to, wait and see. Hmm. Andre, it's been really good to chat to you. Thanks so much for chatting to us all the way from Russia. Um, I hope everything goes well. I hope those flights aren't too long. And I really want to wish you well for the rest of the season because, like you said, the squad is a, is a bit thin, but I'm sure you guys will pull through. Mm. No, thank you very much, Ron. And uh, yo, thanks for having me once again. And That's lekker. I'm sure yeah. we'll, we'll have a bit of a catch-up on the seasons. So I'm going to do a bit of like a review. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> thanks, Andre. All right. All the Cheers, best, man. Go well. Bye-bye.